I'm Dennis Anderson along with Greg Grell and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Northern Minnesota lawmakers are here to talk about the upcoming Minnesota legislative session and the new state budget forecast just out today. The co-owner and marketing chick of the locally laid egg company is here to talk about her new book and why middle architect agriculture <laughs> is so vitally important. And we'll have the week's business headlines and journey back to a story in the news 25 years ago. That we will. Stay right where you are. Almanac North is next. Welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Almanac North producer Greg Grell filling in for Julie tonight. Good to have you by my side instead of up in the booth this evening. It's good to be here. Well, thank you very kindly. We've got some great guests. A couple of segments. Let's get started. All right. Thank you, Denny. A little over a week from now, Minnesota lawmakers will be heading back to St. Paul for the second half of the state's biennial legislative session. The so-called short session is even shorter than usual this year due to construction at the state capitol. That means lawmakers will have a little over two months to hash out a number of important bills before adjourning for the year. Well, joining us with an outlook for the session is State Representative Jennifer Schultz. She's a Democrat from Duluth. And Representative Jason Metza is a DFLer from Virginia. And thanks so much to both of you for being here today. Representative Schultz, just today the state budget forecast came out. It's a lower uh, surplus than what had been expected. Do you think that'll impact the session? I think it will, but we were expecting a lower forecast, and I think Representative Paul Thiessen had forecasted correctly that it would be lower. So we initially thought it was $1.2 billion. It is now $900 million. Um, so it's less money, but it also indicates that maybe we shouldn't be using the surplus for a huge tax cut or for transportation funding, which needs to be really dedicated funds, because we don't have a surplus every biennium. Mm -hmm. I know there's been a lot of chatter about extended family leave, uh, and uh, my question is how will ex extended family leave, paid family leave, be offered uh, in years when we don't have such a large surplus? Well, that's a great question, and essentially there's two things that are happening. Right now we've got the governor's proposal, uh, which he did for his staff at uh, the Capitol, and state employees, and we have a proposal that I'm going to be chief mm -hmm. authoring with right. Senator Sieben, and essentially uh, what we're looking at is offering up to 12 weeks, and the program <coughs> will be structured similar to unemployment insurance with a s small employer-employee match uh, that basically provides a safety net for those families that either are having a newborn and or caring for a loved one. Would there be problems with that system if there isn't as much surplus or no? Nope, it shouldn't affect it at all actually. Okay. We'll have some initial funding that would need to get done to do the structure, right. but we can piggyback off existing uh, UI insurance models and agency policy and procedural. Do you expect, uh, Jason, to introduce that quite early on? Yes, it'll be, uh, I believe the launch is going to be March 7th. The details are getting hammered out right now, so I'll make sure to get it off and let you know. Representative Schultz, you mentioned transportation, and that's been a huge issue in the state. Both Republicans and Democrats agree something needs to be done, but nobody's been able to come to an agreement at the table. Do you think there'll be some, some movement this well, session? Well, you know, I was optimistic when mm -hmm. the chair of that committee, um, Representative Kelly, said we need a transportation bill this mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. And then I became a little bit less optimistic because when we just had the press conference with our leadership on both sides and Governor Dayton, they were arguing about this in front of the press, and it wasn't um, very positive, and it indicated that we're pretty far apart on what, how we can fund transportation. And, you know, with the smaller surplus, the Republicans really want to give a tax cut to big businesses. And so they keep talking about tax cuts to working families, mm -hmm. but most of their bill is tax cuts to big businesses. So we keep, have to keep that in mind, and I think people would rather have Solid streets, no potholes, safe bridges, 
than tax cuts to businesses, I which, mean, large businesses. Which leads into the question, could Minnesotans see an increase in the taxoline gas, tax gas, uh, to pay for bridges, highway construction? I think that uh, it's something that we shouldn't take off the table. I've been on the show supportive of it in the past. I think when uh, you see gas prices fluctuating by a dollar for the nickel uh, that we were proposing initially, it's not too much to ask Minnesotans uh, for a fund that's actually dedicated and constitutionally protected. Gas prices are down right now, but maybe in the future they're back up to $4 a gallon. Yep, and that's the nickel won't change. It's not tied to inflation or anything. Um, and so essentially, uh, the governor doesn't feel that it's going to make it. He did say uh, today or yesterday, I believe, that he thought the gas tax was on life support, I guess, at best, uh, which moved from being dead, which is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> but we do need to look at formulas that aren't just going to take one time general fund surpluses, which we do have a lot of in our tax bills right now, or in our uh, budget right now. And so if we can make some systemic investments that have a broad appeal for the metro, uh, our suburbs, and greater Minnesota, we found historically in Minnesota that works best. I have one more transportation question. Mm -hmm. uh, Duluth and the Twin Cities keep talking about uh, passenger train service being restored. Is there any funding for additional dollars for that project? That I'm not Are sure that will. Are talking about the NLX, NLX route? Yep. So the NLX route, um, Minnesota Department of Transportation wants to work on this project, so they have approved it. It needs to go through an environmental impact study, which will be done by the end of 2017. And then we need to find money so MnDOT can help work on this. And there's been, a, I think it's going it's to happen, we just don't know when. So there's a lot of support for it at the state capitol, a lot of support in our community. Um, but the, you know, the gas tax, going back to that, there have been recently, I think, at least eight states, and some of them um, conservative states, that have passed an increase in their gas tax because they know how important transportation funding is to the economy. It affects everybody. Mm -hmm. Representative Schultz, uh, you are a person that is concerned about health care, health care issues. Uh, do you have any legislation coming up this session dealing with health care? I have a lot, a <laughs> lot of bills um, trying to fix our health care system so it works for all Minnesotans. So I was appointed to a task force on health care finance reform, mm -hmm. and it was made up of 29 member, um, individuals from our community and some legislators. And we were tasked to try to address um, health care costs, affordability, accessibility, and to address health disparities. It's bipartisan. We met at the beginning of August all the way through mid-January. I think it felt like I was meeting every week, going down to the Capitol every week, but it was worth it. The best task force I've ever served on. And um, we came up with 33 recommendations. And so I took some of those recommendations and dropped them as bills. So one is to expand Minnesota Care to 275% um, of the federal poverty level, which right now it's at 200%. So expand mm -hmm. that and make it more affordable for working families. To keep Minsure as a state-based exchange, we found that if we went to the federal exchange, that it would be more expensive for the state. And we can save a lot of money through economies of scale using our IT system for our other public programs as well. So, and then to fix IT in the Minsure yeah. system. Are you optimistic? Do you think much of this can be done this session? It's just, as Greg said, a short session. Well, the Republicans want to um, kill Minnesota Care and. Um, repeal the provider tax that we've had for 20 years that funds it. So it's a 2% provider tax. Most healthcare professionals, health insurance companies want to keep that provider tax because it's funding something that lowers their uncompensated care and benefits the community. So there's another bill to extend the provider tax to keep funding the health mm -hmm. healthcare fund that funds Minnesota Care. So is that, I mean, we're, they want to kill it. So if, as long as we don't kill it, that's successful. So we're playing defense in the minority this session. So a lot might not be done this session, but we're developing the bills, making sure they're sound for we're next session. Keep it session. alive. Keep it alive. Mm -hmm. I even have a bill that is going to start investigating a public option on the exchange, and this is something Hillary Clinton is talking about right now. Nationally. You mentioned though that during this all the the work that you've done, that you did have bipartisan support. Is there anything right. you think that will be supported by the uh, GOP? Yeah, uh, one bill is looking at. We passed a telemedicine telehealth bill last session, and that had bipartisan support. And we're going to evaluate if that's successful, if it reduces costs or if it increases costs. So yeah. there should be bipartisan support on that bill. Okay. Representative Metzo, the governor took a pretty good jab at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he called the, the chamber's study of high taxes a hatchet job. Uh, the governor said uh, the chamber never has anything good to say about uh, the state. Do you agree with the governor? I would say that uh, my local chamber is a heck of a lot different than uh, the Minnesota chamber. And as we get down to the capital, we usually find uh, 
they're kind of the chamber of no. And in almost every committee I've sat on, whether it be for minimum wage, uh, the answer was no. Uh, you look at our uh, unemployment extension that we were trying to do for steel workers, the Minnesota Chamber supported tying that to uh, business tax relief, which you know, is disappointing to use people's hardship for a political chip. But you're finding the Virginia Chamber of Commerce far different? We work uh, well with our local chambers, I think, in our small communities. So ours uh, is much different than the Minnesota Chamber. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got a good relationship mm -hmm. with them. Representative Metza, uh, one thing people might be wondering about is the PolyMet uh, project, the EIS, the state might be making a decision pretty soon. Can you tell us, uh, give us an update on that? So it's been a very lengthy process, as all Minnesotans know now, mm -hmm. and I think it's been thoroughly vetted by our state experts, uh, both in the DNR and in the MPCA, and they've worked with our federal agencies, our tribal governments, and I think got a project that's in good shape. Uh, Governor Dayton's administration hired a really good law firm out of Washington, uh, D.C., and they're going to defend the state in litigation should it come. Probably looking at a couple of lawsuits no matter what? Yeah, so sometimes uh, on a project you'll have a lawsuit that comes out probably on both sides right. uh, with, with the controversy that's surrounded. And the difficult part becomes once it's proven itself to meet our state standards in the feasibility studies, uh, which is the EIS that uh, you guys referred to, uh, the folks who are putting up a lawsuit that would stop the project have to bond and essentially uh, would be liable for lost production should the lawsuit not have merit. So, Are people on the Iron Range uh, optimistic that PolyMed will be a goal and eventually mining will begin? Yeah, I think the East Range is, they're in rough shape. Uh, you know, I've got about, I'd guess, 18 to 20 percent unemployment right now. That's and it's, it's getting worse. Uh, we've got SR, who hasn't been paying their bills on time, uh, which is very disappointing, uh, taking advantage of our local businesses. We've got Magnetation, who recently is going through a bankruptcy. And it's kind of the perfect storm right now on the range, uh, which is why it's crucial to get the benefits extended to those families up there. We're trying to keep a workforce intact. Uh, and a lot of it stems with the global ore prices. You know, this was no one's fault uh, here in Minnesota, not a Republican issue, not a Democrat issue. It's a federal uh, lack of enforcement in our trade law and having some actual teeth, which actually, thanks to Senator Klobuchar, Franken, uh, Congressman Nolan and uh, Governor Dayton, they've been pushing relentlessly on the Obama administration. And Dennis McDonough, who came up, the, gov or the president's chief of staff, uh, I think they relayed we needed to get some stuff done and do it quickly. And that happened this last week, so I'm very glad about that. Representative Schultz, we just have about a minute mm -hmm. left, but uh, it's an election year for everybody in the House. How do you see that changing the dynamics in the legislature? There's always a little bit of you know, playing to the party instead of playing for the good of the state. Is that going to be an issue this you time? You know, it is, and it mm -hmm. probably always is. It mm -hmm. is very frustrating mm -hmm. as a new f legislator to mm -hmm. see that, mm -hmm. that people care more about the elections rather than passing a transportation bill. So it's possible that we don't pass a transportation bill mm -hmm. or a tax bill, mm -hmm. that we just don't mm -hmm. come to an agreement, which would be really, really unfortunate for the state of Minnesota. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. Great discussion. I'm sure we'll have a back, back on. Representative Schultz, Representative Metza, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. It's a growing part of the Northland's economy, winter recreation, something tourism experts say depends a good deal on the public's perception of how conditions are. But ski areas have an advantage, man-made snow that stands up better in warmer temperatures. I think this is as good as it'll ever get in Duluth. <laughs> Why's that? Because of the weather. Usually when you come up here, you have to fear you can't ski. We were quite surprised. The snow was very good for skiing this morning. It's soft, and uh, I don't know how they do it, but it's worked out real well. 
The same does not hold true, however, for snowmobiling. In a normal year, this is what you might expect to see in early February. But the machines themselves are now dormant, and enthusiasts say they are concerned about the effect the lack of snow is having on tourism. We like to look at the snow as, as, as little white dollar signs falling down. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big part of the winter economy of northeastern Minnesota. Snowmobiling is the number one winter sport in the state of Minnesota. Reports indicate most trails have little or no snow. But For Evening Edition, Joe Thornton, KDLH News. How's this for a name? The locally laid egg company made quite a splash a few years back when it was one of four finalists for a commercial during the Super Bowl. The company's Vote Lola strategy raised local awareness of the brand and helped put it on a course for success. Well, it was quite a coup for the husband and wife team that got into the middle agriculture business with very little experience. And now a new book is about to be released that tells the locally laid story with plenty of humor. Here to talk about the book is its author, Lucy Amundsen, co-owner and marketing chick of Locally Laid Egg Company. Lucy, thank you very much for being here. Oh, for my those pleasure. folks who don't know your story, how did you get in the egg business? Well, uh, not gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got in the egg business after uh, my husband Jason lost his position. It was you know a lot of people at that time a few years ago were losing jobs and. Mm -hmm. Um, he just had a vision to go take our backyard flock of five chickens and get some rural land and go to 1800 over a summer. Sure. So you have chickens laying eggs only in the summer then? Well, um, we, we are capable of doing year round. This winter we did not keep a flock, but that's mostly because it's been so difficult to procure young hens I because see. of bird flu. Mm -hmm. We didn't get bird flu, but it really affected my industry. Now you've named all your hens Lola. That's right. Why? It's short for <laughs> locally, short for laid. It's easy to remember. And it's easy to remember. <laughs> it is. So what were some of the surprises when you got involved? I mean, you went from having five chickens in your backyard to having thousands. There are so <laughs> many surprises. Um, but probably one of the biggest ones was how difficult it was to be in this middle sector. We're not, we're not a small farm in that we sell everything at a farmer's market or at a CSA model. And we're certainly not playing with those big uh, commodity models mm -hmm. either. We're in the middle and we never dreamed it'd be so hard to procure chickens, to, to get distribution. Those are things that all mid-sized farmers really struggle with. Sure. How many eggs does a chicken lay in a week? Well, they lay an egg uh, once every 26 hours. I've laid more. Than, I've laid lots of <laughs> eggs here on the air, but show. <laughs> show us. But well, one every 24 hours. 26 hours. 26 so, hours. Really? so every 12 days they have a little egg okay. holiday. Oh, so they okay. Take a vacation. Oh, well, they do, do they? Now you mentioned middle agriculture. That's a mm -hmm. term that you're hearing a little bit more of. Talk about that. That's a kind of a disappearing area of agriculture. It is. Um, between 1997 and 2012, during that short window, America lost 18. Percent of these of these uh, mid-sized farms. That's they're like family farms, kind of. Family farms, yeah. and they um, they're the kind that anchor a community because mm -hmm. uh, a farm is really a a, a business. So mm -hmm. if you lose all these mid-sized businesses, if they get bought up by large corporations, um, you're losing a lot of people who are going to buy locally in their area. Sure. They're not, they use their feed mill, they use processing in their area. And that doesn't happen as much with a big company that's probably quite vertically integrated in their business practices. In your book, there's the term pasture raised eggs. Explain that. Well, pasture raised are birds that are outside. Free roaming. Free roaming, they, we put them in paddocks, which are just fenced in areas with solar electric fencing. And what's great about that is the birds end up with a varied diet. They, you have their, their, your corn and corn and soy ration that they have, mm -hmm. but 
if they're outside, they can eat seeds and bugs and... Worms? Worms, <laughs> frogs that might be in really? the wrong place, wrong time. Uh, <laughs> they will they will hollow out a frog and yeah. into a change purse. And are are they quickly. rotated around the farm a little they bit? They are, not just a little bit, every few days, because oh. that is very important. They can... They will mow through and denude an area in, in no time at all. They are enthusiastic foragers. Huh. It's actually quite, quite joyful to watch. <laughs> now, you mentioned uh, earlier about how uh, it was very difficult to kind of get distribution. You had the advantage, though, of getting some publicity early on, and I think a lot because of the name of your company, Locally Laid. You were in the Super Bowl competition for Intuit. Ta tell people a little bit about that. Well, we... Um, no one was more surprised than we were to end up as finalists in this competition. We joined the competition because we would get free software for a two-week trial mm -hmm. if, you, if you entered this contest. And then all of a sudden, we, people were voting for us, and then we really got into it. And this community was so good to us. They really rallied around it, and marquees were saying vote lola and yeah. uh, pizza places were were glue gunning it on their on their pizza boxes hotels had it in their spots we it were was almost so an, lucky a little bit of an accidental marketing coup then <laughs> it was a marketing coup yeah. um but it also allowed us to to spread some awareness about mm -hmm. about these middle-sized farms because there's just so much attention that one chicken named lola sure. needs you know <laughs> so really we were doing it for this section of the industry a no. practical question. Sure. What do you do with all the manure? Well, actually, um, we are diversifying our farm, and it goes on our fields as we have. We planted a series of berries last summer, uh -huh. and hopefully there'll be some fruition this year. But all of that goes right back into the soil, which is which is great. It's exactly what it, what it should be doing. Now, I want to take a, just a little bit of time here to show the commercial that came okay. out of the Super Bowl competition, and, and uh, we can run that right now. You know what freedom tastes like? To live in a place where you can feel the cool grass between your strange little talon-like toes. The wind beneath your wings, if only for a moment. Because, well, you're a chicken and can't really fly. Where the eggs are pasture-raised and locally laid. Get yourself a little taste of freedom. Get locally laid. Yep, I said it. This ad made possible by Intuit QuickBooks. I can't help but think about Les Nessman and WKRP in Cincinnati when they <laughs> dropped the turkeys from the helicopter because chickens can't fly. They cannot fly. Actually, there was a chicken trainer on set, and he trained the chicken to do lots of things like jump up. And there was, uh, in the storyboard, they said, and this is where the chicken will fly. And I said, oh, um, I think you're going to have to toss that bird. And they're like, no, no, we won't need to toss them. And finally, 45 minutes later, they're like, toss the chicken. <laughs> Can you mix breed of chicken? do they get along they do if they start out together uh, you don't want to add birds in later because uh, pecking order is real it um, is. we I have witnessed untold amounts of bird on bird violence that, that I won't <laughs> I won't get into um, but certainly all those adages you grew up with like come home to roost uh, picking on each other is actually a poultry term so it just shows how chickens are part of Americana um, because we still talk about sure. them. I have a daughter who has about a dozen chickens, and they actually become almost like pets. Sure. They'll follow you along, uh, she'll walk around the yard clucking, and they'll follow her. And they, I think they bring a lot of joy to people, mm -hmm. and that the urban farm movement has been wonderful, so that children understand where their food comes from, yeah. and people feel more self-sufficient. Now let's not let it go by without you holding up your book oh. and talking about it. You're starting the book tour next week, Locally I Laid. Am. It's the story of how you got started, right? It is. It's our personal story. It talks mm. about how um, it was a solve on our marriage. Not really. It was very difficult. <laughs> um, and the great cover's great because that's a chicken butt joke. And yeah. just like in every every time you, you it's look an at it. Lucy, cover. it was excellent. a fun read. I enjoyed reading it. I'm so, so pleased. Thank, thank you, you Denny. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. You bet.
time now for a look at the week's economic stories from the folks at Business North. RJS Construction Group, a 59-year-old Superior-based construction company, announced Tuesday it will close most functions and wind down operations through the end of 2016. Formerly known as Reuben Johnson & Son, the firm will fulfill commitments for work already underway. The closure was made by the Board of Directors of Capstan Corporation, the parent company of RJS. Capstan CEO Todd Johnson said the company had to recognize the economic changes and challenges that have come to exist in the marketplace. Johnson said Capstan will try to find open positions for RGS workers elsewhere in its workforce. A 13-year-old Bovee fishing products manufacturer is expanding with the help of a bank participation loan approved last week by the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Board. KMDA, which had nearly $2 million in sales last year, is purchasing Baker Tools and will relocate the firm from Hershey, Pennsylvania to Bovee. KMDA will construct a 13,000 square foot building across from its existing location on the Iron Range. It previously has acquired similar established companies in the sport fishing market. The IRRRB also will provide partial funding for a pilot scale demonstration of ilmenite processing technology. The board allocated $300,000 for the project, which will be matched by the University of Minnesota. Ilmenite, which appears in deposits northeast of Hoyt Lakes and south of the Mesabi Range, is considered a high-value mineral. It contains titanium and is used in jet engines, airframes, and space and missile applications. Working with partners in Canada, NRRI will do laboratory work and conduct experiments at its Coleraine facility that could bring Ilmenite to the market. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on this week's show, now's the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message. Or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org and visit the WDSE website for the latest updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, and more. And Greg, thanks for sitting in for Julie tonight. It was great working with you. This is kind of a career highlight for me, getting to anchor with Dennis Anderson. Well, <laughs> nice to, as we said at the outset, nice to have you out of the booth and in front it, of the it, camera. It's nice to evening. be down here. It's a good All perspective. Right. For Greg and the rest of the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.